When two people get married and set up housekeeping together, the law in each state is pretty definite on the rights each party in the relationship has. These days, though, there are more than just the traditional marriage agreements to consider. Millions of Americans from every state in the Union are living together without being formally married. This can pose a problem if the relationship ends, especially if there are assets and children to consider. Martha Ertman recognized this and decided to offer people in non-traditional relationships some advice on what landmines they could encounter along the way. Ertman is a law professor at the University of Maryland's Carey School of Law and has taught, written, and spoken extensively on contracts and family law. She's also the author of the book Love's Promises, How Formal and Informal Contracts Shape All Kinds of Families. She says cohabitation is nothing new. In fact, in this country, it was a way to keep society going when people lived in far-flung parts of the country. Common law marriage came up in an age where we didn't have formal registrations. There weren't so many clergy. There weren't so many courthouses to be able to do that. Or it could be you're married to one person, and then you move out to Iowa, and then you move in, you shack up with somebody new and hold yourself out as married. And the law then has to decide which marriage counts. Hertman says that the oft-heard provision that a couple had to be together for seven years before they could be considered to be married by common law is a myth. It is a complete myth that you have to do it for any period of time. The test is living together and holding yourselves out as what used to be husband and wife. Now it could be wife and wife or husband and husband. But if you're living together but you just call each other boyfriend or girlfriend, you can't be common law married. So really it's the social relationship. Today there are about 12 jurisdictions that do recognize it. The problem is most people don't know what kind of jurisdiction they're in. So if you're in the District of Columbia, you can be common law married. But just a walk away in Maryland or Virginia, you can't be common law married. One of the reasons Ertman says she wrote the book in layman's terms was to make sure people understood all of the legal ramifications and provisions of the relationships they undertake. It's good to know, for example, that if you are common law married in Washington, D.C., or any state that allows it, Generally speaking, your marriage is recognized in states where there is no common law marriage. To find case law and history on cohabitation, we don't have to go back to frontier days. Anyone who is over 50 years old will remember the big Hollywood palimony case involving actor Lee Marvin and his partner Michelle Triola. It gave us a language. The word palimony came out of that case and the tremendous media attention that resulted when it came down out of the California Supreme Court in 1976. So palimony is a cross between pal and alimony. And the idea is if you live together and in the Lee Marvin, Michelle Triola situation, she said, I'll give up my singing career if you support me for life. Or he said, if you give up your singing career, I'll support you for life. And that was the first time a court said that is a legally binding promise. Now, what most people don't know is after the Supreme Court said she could sue, the lower court said she hadn't really proved up all the things she had to to prevail. And it was later people who actually got to get some compensation for the work they did. But why go through all of that if you're in a committed relationship, own a house together, Together, joint accounts, maybe even have children. Why not just get married and forego the potential problems? One of the things I learned as I was researching this book about all the reasons people don't get married, sometimes it's law. So before, lots of same-sex couples could not get married. So the law kept them from getting married, then all they could do is live together. Similarly, as you say, if you've got one spouse, you can't get another spouse. Some people think, ugh, marriage is so old-fashioned. I think that we're going to have that question be answered in the near future because same-sex marriage 
calls the question. Now that gay people can get married in any state in the union, the question is whether these alternatives that are known by different names like civil unions and domestic partnerships, reciprocal beneficiaries in different states, they have different names, whether those alternatives will go by the wayside. And I hope they don't because love comes in different packages. Ertman says that some of those packages involve strong bonds between two people without romantic love. And she says these people should be considered partners despite the fact that they never would get married. Oftentimes there might be adult sisters who are the hugest thing in each other's lives. They may live together, they share a bank account, and it's unfair to treat them different from a spouse relationship. A marriage license isn't the only legal document that can provide property division and financial stability for a non-spousal partner. Both partners can also make out wills to take care of the issue. Hertman agrees that a will is a good idea. Unfortunately, most Americans never get around to drawing one up. For the same reason most people don't make living together agreements, most people don't make wills. So the law's job is to say, okay, you have freedom of contract. If you want to make a will, have at it. But for the vast majority of people who don't get around to it, whether they don't want to think about their death or they don't want to make the decisions or it's just intimidating or expensive, then the law has to have a background rule. And that's where these statutes called intestacy statutes come in, saying if you don't bother to make a will, it goes to the people we define as your family. And that could be somebody you've lived together with. That's one way that the cohabitation usness could get recognized and, in fact, has been recognized in some of the cases that I talk about. It seems that right now, no matter how a couple decides to divvy up the assets and property, if they aren't married, they need to write their intentions clearly. That way, if there are any disputes, the court has more than he said, she said to go on. Contract law has this term called the statute of frauds that says certain kinds of agreements have to be in writing to be legally binding. So if it's an agreement about selling your house, that has to be in writing to be binding because it's such a big transaction. Some states require living together agreements to be in writing in order to be binding. So you mentioned Lee Marvin, the Marvin Agreement is recognized in almost every single state, but a good number of them require it to be in writing. One of the proposals that I put forward in the book is that there shouldn't be that writing requirement because so many people reasonably expect that the oral promise will count. And so I would say if you're acting like an us, if you are sharing your bank accounts, if you're sharing your lives together socially and emotionally, then the law should treat you like an us and enforce that promise. Ertman has included some sample contracts in the book for people who want to take the safe road and spell out their relationship on paper. In the back of the book, there's an appendix with real-life contracts. There's an example of a really short cohabitation agreement that people could enter, both with legal promises, like we share property that comes into the household while we're in our relationship, but also things that are not legally binding. These arrangements I call deals. So, for example, One of the clauses I put in there says there's a cooling off period of three days. Nobody gets to end the relationship without taking a three-day break, basically taking a very long walk around the block. And then if at the end of three days you still want to end the relationship, then you can do it. But it may well be you do with a little clearer head and therefore make arrangements that are probably a little more fair in the long run. As she said earlier, there are many different ways that people love each other, and governments shouldn't make it difficult for them to deal with the legal aspects of their relationship. Hertman says that creating laws for cohabitation isn't that complicated if you look at these non-traditional partnerships as offshoots of the traditional marriage agreement. One thing that's fortunate, or unfortunate, or just is, is that there are patterns. Most people are heterosexual. Most people do get married at some point in their lives. Most people are raising children that they're genetically related to. 
because those are the most common arrangements, I call that plan A, and the family law rules properly would say, okay, if most people get married at some point, often more than once, then that makes it sense to be the default for particular rights and duties. But if instead there are variations, then like being an adoptive mother, you have a little different set of rules. You get an adjective associated with it, adoptive, uh, before mother, and then there can be special rules for it. So I think that it's not as complicated as it seems if you recognize there's a general rule that's going to apply to probably 9 out of 10 situations, but you still need exceptions for the last 10%. Martha Erdman explains the legal ins and outs of marriage and cohabitation in her book, Love's Promises, available in stores and online. She also addresses the legal agreements for different types of parenting arrangements, such as surrogates, co-parenting, and adoption in the book. Find out more about our guest, Martha Ertman, and her book, Love's Promises, How Formal and Informal Contracts Shape All Kinds of Families, at viewpointsradio.org. This segment originally aired in August 2015 and was written by Pat Reuter. I'm Gary Price. Detecting the brain changes of Alzheimer's disease before symptoms appear can be done today only through expensive PET scans or spinal fluid tests. But researchers are homing in on a simple, inexpensive blood test that might spot changes up to 20 years before symptoms appear. Multiple studies presented at the Alzheimer's Association International Conference 2020 show that specific proteins are detectable in the blood as early as age 25 that correspond to the buildup of toxic tangles in the brain. Dr. Maria Carrillo is Chief Science Officer of the Alzheimer's Association. These are early results, but they are encouraging. There is an urgent need for simple, inexpensive, and non-invasive diagnostic tools for Alzheimer's. An early blood test would allow people with Alzheimer's and those at risk to plan for the future, and it could speed drug development by identifying the right people for clinical trials. Dr. Carrillo says the tests require further large-scale studies before they can be made widely available. Find out more at alz.org. And that's Viewpoints for this week. Viewpoints is a production of MediaTrax Communications. Follow us on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram to learn more about upcoming shows. And find a library of past programs on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, and Spotify. Plus, you'll always find previous segments and more information about our guests at viewpointsradio.org. Join us again next week for another edition of Viewpoints. Coming up on Viewpoints. My parents, like so many Holocaust survivors, didn't really start talking about their experiences until maybe 50 years later. The untold stories of the Holocaust. Then... If you get an email from Winnie Mandela, that's not a bad day, is it? That's a fun thing to happen. One man's mission to scam the scammers. I'm Marty Peterson. And I'm Gary Price. These stories in-depth on your public affairs magazine, Viewpoints.